TQQQ has grown in popularity after a decade-long raging bull market for large-cap growth stocks and specifically big tech. But is it a good investment for a long-term hold strategy? Let's dive in. Hey guys, John Williamson here, OptimizePortfolio.com, investing in personal finance. What is TQQQ? TQQQ is a 3x leveraged ETF from Invesco that aims to deliver 3x the daily returns of the NASDAQ 100 index. Explaining how a leveraged ETF works is beyond the scope of this video, but I delved into that a bit in a separate video. Basically, these funds provide enhanced exposure without additional capital by using debt and swaps. This greater exposure usually comes at a pretty hefty cost. In this case, an expense ratio of 0.95% at the time of this video. The normal 1x fund, QQQ, has an expense ratio of about one-fifth that at 0.20%. These funds are typically used by day traders, but recently there seems to be more interest in holding them over the long term. TQQQ has become extremely popular in recent years due to the bull run from large cap tech which comprises a huge percentage of the fund. But what about volatility decay? The daily resetting of leveraged ETFs means the fund only provides the return multiple relative to the underlying index on a daily basis, not necessarily over the long term. Because of this, volatility of the index can eat away at gains. This is known as volatility decay or beta slippage. Unfortunately, the financial blogosphere took the scary sounding volatility decay and ran with it to erroneously conclude that holding a leveraged ETF for more than a day is a cardinal sin, ignoring the simple underlying math that actually helps on the way up. In short, volatility decay is not as big of a deal as it's made out to be, and we would expect the enhanced returns to overcome any volatility drag and fees. I'm not one to parrot the leveraged ETFs can be wiped out idea, thanks to modern circuit breakers, but if QQQ drops by 5%, TQQQ drops by 15%. People tend to focus on volatility decay and forget that major drawdowns are actually the bigger concern here. This is because simple math again tells us that it requires great gains to recover from great losses. As a simplistic example using dollars, suppose your $100 portfolio drops by 10% or $10 to $90. You now require an 11% gain to get back to $100. The graph shown illustrates in theory why a 100% TQQQ position is not a good investment for a long-term hold strategy. Many are jumping into TQQQ after seeing the last decade bull run of large cap growth stocks, as TQQQ has only been around since 2010 and is up over 5,000% from then through 2020. Looks great, right? Not so fast. This is called recency bias using recent behavior to assume the same behavior will continue into the future. As we know, past performance does not indicate future performance. Moreover, a decade, especially one without a major crash, is a terribly short amount of time in investing from which to draw any sort of meaningful conclusions. So we need to go back further to get a better idea of how TQQQ might have performed through major stock market crashes, which can be done by simulating returns going back further than the fund's inception. Going back to 1987 for TQQQ versus the underlying QQQ tells a somewhat different story. Notice how if you buy and hold TQQQ alone, it is basically a timing gamble that depends heavily on your entry and exit points. Basically, it can take too long for the leveraged ETF to recover after a major crash. After the dot-com crash of 2000, TQQQ didn't catch up to QQQ until late 2007, right before it crashed again in the global financial crisis of 2008. Had you bought in January 2000, right before the dot-com crash, you'd still be in the red today. So far, I haven't even touched on the psychological aspects of this idea. Most investors severely overestimate their tolerance for risk and can't stomach a major crash with a 100% stocks position much less a 300% stocks position. Holding TQQQ through the dot-com crash would have seen a near 100% drawdown. The previous graph tells us 100% TQQQ may only be a viable strategy if we can perfectly predict and time the market, which we know is basically impossible. So how can we make it work? By using a hedge to mitigate those harmful drawdowns. 
Diversification is your friend with leveraged ETFs. Treasury bonds offer the greatest degree of uncorrelation to stocks of any asset. TMF is a very popular leveraged ETF for long-term treasury bonds. This is the same basis of the famous hedge fund strategy. Once again, the beautiful 60-40 portfolio, in this case 3x for 180-120 exposure, emerges as the best option, at least historically, in terms of both general and risk-adjusted returns. While we expect lower bond returns in the future, it doesn't mean TMF won't still do its job. Think of it as a parachute insurance policy that bails you out in stock crashes. Also remember, the NASDAQ 100 is basically a tech index, posing a concentration risk, and growth stocks are looking extremely expensive in terms of current valuations, so they now have lower future expected returns. For these reasons, I'm a fan of using UPRO instead, which is the hedge funding strategy. I've gotten a lot of questions about and a lot of the comments and discussions on TQQQ strategies focus on the use, utility, and viability of long-term treasury bonds as a significant chunk of this strategy. I'll briefly address and hopefully quell these concerns here. Again, by diversifying across uncorrelated assets, we mean holding different assets that will perform well at different times. For example, when stocks zig, bonds tend to zag. Those two assets are negatively correlated we hope for uncorrelation on average. Holding both provides a smoother ride, reducing portfolio volatility, which is variability of return, and risk. Common comments nowadays about bonds include, bonds are useless at low yields, bonds are for old people, long bonds are too volatile and too susceptible to interest rate risk, corporate bonds pay more, interest rates can only go up from here, bonds will be toast, bonds return less than stocks, so why long-term treasuries? First, it is fundamentally incorrect to say that bonds must necessarily lose money in a rising interest rate environment. Bonds only suffer when those interest rates rise faster than expected. Bonds handle low and slow rate increases just fine. Look at the period of rising interest rates between 1940 and about 1975, where bonds kept rolling at their par and paid that sweet, steady coupon. Number two, bond pricing does not happen in a vacuum. We've had several periods of rising interest rates where long bonds delivered a positive return. From 1992 to 2000, interest rates rose by about 3%, and long treasury bonds returned about 9% annualized for the period. From 2003 to 2007, interest rates rose by about 4%, and long treasury bonds returned about 5% annualized for the period. From 2015 to 2019, interest rates rose by about 2%, and long treasury bonds returned about 5% annualized for that period. New bonds bought by a bond index fund in a rising rate environment will be bought at the higher rate, while old ones at the previous lower rate are sold off. You're not stuck with the same yield for your entire investing horizon. We know that treasury bonds are an objectively superior diversifier alongside stocks compared to corporate bonds. This is also why I don't use the popular total bond market fund, BND. It has been noted that this greater degree of uncorrelation between treasury bonds and stocks is conveniently amplified during periods of market turmoil, which researchers referred to as crisis alpha. Again, remember we need and want the greater volatility of long-term bonds so that they can more effectively counteract the downward movement of stocks, which are riskier and more volatile than bonds. We're using them to reduce the portfolio's volatility and risk. More volatile assets make better diversifiers. Most of the portfolio's risk is still being contributed by stocks. For number nine, this one's probably the most important. We're not talking about bonds held in isolation, which would probably be a bad investment right now. We're talking about them in the context of a diversified portfolio alongside stocks, for which they are still the usual flight to safety asset during stock downturns. Specifically, in this context, the purchase of the bond side is purely as an insurance parachute to bail you out in a stock market crash. Though they provided a major boost to this strategy's returns over the last 40 years while interest rates were dropping, we're not really expecting any real returns from the bond side going forward, and we're intrinsically assuming that the stock side is the primary driver of the strategy's returns. Even if rising rates mean bonds are a comparatively worse diversifier for stocks in terms of future expected returns during that period, 
does not mean they are not still the best diversifier to use. Similarly, short-term decreases in bond prices do not mean the bonds are not still doing their job of buffering stock downturns. Historically, when treasury bonds moved in the same direction as stocks, it was usually up. Interest rates are likely to stay low for a while. Also, there's no reason to expect interest rates to rise just because they are low. People have been claiming rates can only go up for the past 20 years or so, and they haven't. They have gradually declined for the last 700 years without reversion to the mean. Negative rates aren't out of the question, and we're seeing them used in some foreign countries. Bond convexity means their asymmetric risk return profile favors the upside. Again, I acknowledge that post-Volcker monetary policy resulting in falling interest rates has driven the particularly stellar returns of the raging bond bull market since 1982. But I also think the Fed and US monetary policy are fundamentally different since the Volcker era, likely allowing us to avoid runaway inflation environments like the late 1970s going forward. Bond prices already have expected inflation baked in. The late David Swinson summed it up nicely in his book, Unconventional Success. The purity of non-callable long-term default-free treasury bonds provides the most powerful diversification to investor portfolios. Okay, bonds rant over. If you still feel some dissonance, the next section may offer some solutions. It's unlikely that any of the following will improve the total return of a strategy like this and whether or not they'll improve risk-adjusted return is up for debate but those concerned about inflation, rising rates, volatility, drawdowns, etc., and or TMF's future ability to adequately serve as an insurance parachute may want to diversify a bit with some of the following options. LTPZ, which is long-term tips or inflation-linked bonds. FAS, 3X financials. Banks tend to do well when interest rates rise. EDC, 3X emerging markets. You can diversify outside the U.S., UTSL, 3X utilities, which I'm a fan of, have the lowest correlation to the market of any sector and tend to fare well during recessions and crashes. YINN is 3X China, which is lowly correlated to the US. UGL is 2X gold. Gold is usually lowly correlated to both stocks and bonds, but it has a long-term expected real return of about zero. There are also no 3X gold funds available now. DRN, 3X REITs, you get an arguable diversification benefit from real assets. EDV, US Treasury Strips, or TYD, 3X Intermediate Treasuries, both of those would have less interest rate risk comparatively. Lastly, there's a fund from Cambria called TAIL, which is out of the money put options to hedge TAIL risk. Most of the fund is intermediate treasury bonds and TIPS. So what about DCA, or dollar cost averaging, or regular deposits? The previous back tests buy and hold TQQQ with a starting balance of $10,000 and no additional deposits. Some will point out that an investor will usually be regularly depositing into the portfolio and that this would change the results. Since the market tends to go up and since major crashes are typically infrequent, regular deposits of $1,000 a month actually don't change the end result that much. You'll need to rebalance a strategy like this regularly. I used quarterly rebalancing in the previously shown backtests. You might want to use M1 Finance to implement this type of strategy, as the broker makes rebalancing extremely easy with one click, and they even feature automatic rebalancing through which new deposits are directed to the underweight asset. I'll include links to my comprehensive review of the platform and a pie to invest in this strategy. In conclusion, don't buy and hold TQQQ or any leveraged stocks ETF naked for the long term without a hedge of some sort, because sometimes they simply can't recover from major drawdowns. The last decade has looked great for TQQQ, but don't succumb to recency bias. Do you use TQQQ in your portfolio? Let me know in the comments.